we would do like a Monday update, but while I'm doing it, I'm also performing emergency surgery on a very important bear. He is named Jer, well, it was Jeremy Barmy, but my son couldn't say that, so we called him Jeremy Burmy. So his name's Jeremy Burmy. And Jeremy Burmy has a hole, and that just has to be repaired. So I thought I'd do a little update um, and story time. So my update is this. I am doing really well. Um, I'm doing really well physically. Um, it has been about two weeks since my cortisone shot and it, I'm feeling pr pretty good. I have some pain um, still, but very minimal in that left knee. My right knee does hurt a little bit as well, but not horribly. I have let it rest for over two weeks. Um, so this morning I did get up and I rode the exercise bike. I did just 30 minutes. And I did seven miles in 30 minutes. So not like, not incredibly fast, not incredibly slow. It was just a very consistent pace. And it feels good. I'm still um, not too, not too sore. Um, so I'm feeling really good about that. The problem that I have is that I am, I'm a person, I'm not patient. And so when I feel pretty good, I tend to, lose my mind and go really overboard. And I'm trying, I'm trying not to do that. Um, which is probably why part of what got me in the position that I'm in. So it's hard. It's hard because I do depend on my exercise as a, um, natural endorphin high and a break and mental, um, break from my kids, from life in general. And I can just, um, feel good for a little while and I haven't had that. So I really loved doing that this morning. Um, so I started to think, God, what was it about me that put me in this position, not only with my health, but also with beach body. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the coaching side, um, and what made me susceptible to that. And not only that, but the fact that in my family, I am one of five, um, five kids and four out of the five of us have tried multi-level marketing and it was like holy cow what what is it that has has brought that what what drove that and so I I've really been kind of analyzing it and I think I think Jeremy is fixed Jeremy's fixed okay so I've really been thinking about that what what was it that pushed us there? So I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of background. When I was in kindergarten, and I am the youngest of the five, when I was in kindergarten, my dad had a brain tumor and uh, went through chemo radiation, the whole nine yards. And prior to that, <laughs> my mom was pretty close to leaving him um, because of some of his actions. But she didn't, she stayed. She stayed with him through the cancer, got him um, to the point where he was in remission. And then they got divorced my second grade year. And I really think that that is part of what drove all of us to want to be fairly high achieving, really successful, um, because we didn't want to be in the position that she found herself in. So she found herself in a position of trying to support five children on a high school diploma, trying to do things for the most part alone. Um, my dad was not a whole lot of help growing up. So we have that side, the financial side, the scary side. But then we also have over here where, you know, when I would get sick at school, I would have to walk home and I would have to go home to an empty house because my mom had to work. She couldn't leave. She had to be at work. And so she felt super guilty all the time that she couldn't be there for us. And so it was like, how do I, how do I have both? How do I have both the financial security, but still also be able to be there for my kids? And I think that has always been in the back of our head. Um, so there was that part. And then as, as a child, then I didn't realize some of the, um, I guess, mental health issues that I had. Um, I definitely always struggled with depression and anxiety. Um, I had 
I actually had an ulcer when I was in the fifth grade because I was so worried all the time and I felt like everything was my responsibility. Um, and I can recognize now that I have learned a lot more uh, that I also have OCD. Um, and I've worked a lot on that the last few years. I have a child that has a really severe OCD that we did an intense outpatient therapy for um, every day, four hours a day for eight or nine weeks. And I learned a lot about myself in that process as well. For me, and I don't, I don't want to talk about um, OCD like I'm an expert because there are so many different types of OCD. There are, and depression and anxiety. There are so many different um, facets of it that it may be different for every person. So what I am sharing is strictly my experience. Um, for me with OCD, I definitely suffer from the type of OCD called scrupulosity. And scrupulosity is the worry that you will never be good enough morally, um, that you're not, you're, you're going to put too much burden on someone else, that um, you have to be the best. And not just like performance wise, but also morally, spiritually, ethically. Um, and that put, a, I put a lot of pressure on myself in that aspect. Um, and one of the reasons that I recognize that is that I also have a child who does that. Um, and so the things that I was praised for growing up, you know, you were so conscientious, you're always concerned about other people. Yes. And those can be good things, but when they, overwhelm you to the point that it becomes detrimental to your own health and well-being, that's when it becomes a problem. So I would focus on that. I would focus on trying to be the best, do the best, and not put a burden on my mom. And that's a lot to handle as a child. And I coped by turning to food. And uh, then I would get so frustrated with myself and with my weight that then I would starve myself or I would take laxatives or work out for hours on end to try and compensate for it, to make up for whatever binge I had had. And what I didn't understand is that I was actually putting myself in that binge cycle by not giving my body what it needed. Um, and so it just was this nonstop uh, roller coaster. And definitely having depression and anxiety and then OCD, all of those things kind of rolled into one, really kind of made me spiral. Then I was thinking about, um, okay, so then what happened once I became an adult? Um, I got married at 23. I was almost 24 when I got married. And we had a baby the next year. Um, we had our first anniversary and our first baby in the same week. Um, and really the same things. And as a newly married couple with a baby, we struggled. We struggled financially. We were also just trying to get used to each other and being pregnant was not easy during that time frame. And we had a lot of bumps and I gained a lot of weight during my pregnancy. I don't know the exact amount, but I did gain quite a bit of weight. And then it was like, oh my gosh, I have to get it off. But now I'm nursing and we were working opposite shifts. We never saw each other and we were struggling financially. It just was a hot mess. Um, and we didn't really fix it. We just kind of continued to add to it with more children. We purchased a condo, all of these different things. And I began to struggle again with the feeling that, oh my gosh, we're struggling financially and I can't be home with my kids. I have them in daycare because I was working full time. And at that point I was making more than my husband was um, because I was pretty established in my career and it was hard. That's when I discovered Turbo Jam. That's when I discovered um, some of these workout programs that would become instrumental in me getting into Beachbody. And I, I kind of spiraled again. Uh, we continued that process um, of struggling financially, struggling um, emotionally. The one thing that I do remember, um, I had just started a new job um, as an HR manager at a call center and we had our like VP, our head boss, had flown out 
from Atlanta and I knew she was going to be there Monday morning. Well, that weekend, my um, youngest at that point, so my second child, was diagnosed with RSV and was in the hospital with RSV pretty badly, but I didn't feel like I could stay there because I was fairly new at my job and the big boss was flying out and I felt like I had to leave my child at the hospital so that I could go to work. So when I did that, and, and it was really funny because she could tell I was, she's like, I, I, you know, only talked to you over the phone, but is some, is everything okay? And I was like, no, not really. This is what's going on. And the look on her face. And she said, you know, I, you need to leave right now. Your baby needs you at the hospital. And I felt guilty and I felt like I wasn't doing enough. Again, this is where that OCD comes in. I wasn't doing enough. I wasn't being enough in any area of my life and I felt like a failure because in my mind not being able to be at work at that point in time was a failure not being at the hospital was a failure so no matter what I did I was a failure and it really kind of just snowballed um I began staying home after we had our fourth baby and we were lucky at that point we were able to flip where my husband began making more money than I did um <clears throat> but we had also been used to having, you know, the two incomes and going down to one income was really hard, but also paying daycare for four babies was going to be really hard. So I started staying home and that's when I really kind of lost myself in that it was a whole new world. My fourth baby was not easy. Um, she cried all the time for no reason. I couldn't calm her down. Uh, she was just hard and I was no longer, I no longer felt high achieving. Let's put it that way. I was, um, just, I felt like I was spinning my wheels and being a mom is definitely a long game. You don't get that immediate recognition. You don't get the immediate, um, attaboys, you know, you changed 10 diapers today. Woohoo. You don't get that. Um, instead you just are like, oh my gosh, there's another one. <laughs> so it was hard. I had gone from being a high performer to not even knowing what I was doing in a day. And it, it was hard and it hurt. And we, again, were still kind of struggling financially, um, because we had gone down from two incomes to one income. We moved to Washington, um, state to the Seattle area for my husband's job and I didn't have friends when we moved up there. Let me preface that. When we first moved up there, I didn't know anybody there. Um, we quickly were just kind of embraced by our church community and they were amazing and became some of my best friends and are still some of my best friends today. But I didn't have family. I didn't have that, um, that built in network. And I was pregnant with our fifth and final child at that point. And it was a really rough pregnancy. It was a rough delivery. It was a rough recovery. Uh, it just, it was not the way I had envisioned it to be. And I went into a deep depression after and gained a lot of weight and was so unhappy with myself. I was unhappy physically. I was unhappy emotionally. I was unhappy with our finances. I was unhappy in every aspect. Um, I loved my husband and I knew my husband loved me. That part we weren't, um, that part wasn't an issue. I just realized I'm still sitting here hugging the bear, whatever. Uh, but all of these other areas, I felt so out of control and I am very much a person that likes to be in control. And that's when I found Beachbody. And, and I think that that is one of the, <coughs> one of the things that, Beachbody preys on, um, all of those insecurities, they had a solution for. You, oh, you grew up with a single mom who couldn't afford to be there for you, who couldn't afford basics and necessities. You can be at home with your babies and you can do that. It, it appealed to me. It jumped right into me that, yes, this is the answer. What I didn't understand is that I would end up putting more money into it than I made that the community 
and the friendship and the love and the support and the recognition was only there as long as I was making them money. Um, you would, it was so funny. I, I was listening to something that really kind of brought all this back. You would have to achieve certain goals in order to get on your uplines calendar. In order to be able to talk to people, you would have to meet objectives. And if you didn't, you couldn't talk to them. Then if you did and you were able to access your leaders, if you didn't continue to maintain that same level, you would get dropped from Facebook groups, from text, um, text groups, from Facebook messenger groups, group chats. You would get dropped from those if you didn't maintain a certain level. The amount of emotional manipulation that happens is crazy. I know now that it's called love bombing. It was love bombing to tag me in a post every week with how great I was doing and that I was on the leaderboard. That made me feel so good. It was love bombing. And when I didn't achieve it, I felt horrible and wanted to get back on. So what MLMs do is they search for those vulnerabilities and they search for that person who feels all those things and then they make sure that that is what they target. When you do a post, when you do a message, you are you are looking for those things and it's, it is highly predatory and I can say that because I did that. I did that and they teach you that it's a good thing. They teach you that it is a good thing to reach out to other women who are in your same position. Do you know what? Reaching out to other people who are in your same position to offer love and support, that is a good thing. Reaching out because you see them as a potential customer or target, and if they say no, you really just kind of quit interacting with them, that's predatory. And that's what you're taught to do. You're not taught to support. You're taught to prey on vulnerabilities because they can become a member of your team. And you see it as this like altruistic thing, and it's not. It's dark and it feels gross and it's like you know I'm friending all of these people strictly to try and get leads and I look back at it now and I'm like oh my gosh how did I get to that point but I got to that point because of where I was and because they they targeted all of those vulnerabilities so what I wanted to basically share with that is that if you have those same areas that you feel hurt in, the same areas that you are struggling with, it is great to find a community and someone that supports you, but don't find a community that is based on money. Don't find a community that is based on um, deceit. It's on deceit and you can find communities of people who are amazing and who will support you without ulterior motives. And that's what you need to look for. So there's, again, a little bit of, a little history, a little more than you ever wanted to know. And I, today I am, uh, I'm able to balance um, to some extent the different um, levels that I have with medication so that I can not feel those same struggles with OCD uh, depression, anxiety, and then I've also learned how to put myself in situations where I can do exposure therapy for my OCD, and it has helped drastically. Um, I don't feel nearly the same levels of compulsions that I had previously. If you need help, whether it is physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, search for a professional. Search for someone who can truly help you, not someone who just is wanting to get financial gain because that is what these reps are doing. They're not qualified. They're not qualified to help you with any of these things. So find someone who is. Please um, feel free to comment below. Let me know if this resonated with you, if you found yourself in a similar position. Um, Remember to like and subscribe so that I can just try to help more people because that is what I want to do now is truly help people in the way that I thought I was helping before, but I wasn't. I hope you guys all have a great day.